Looks like we got Christian, Brian, Elizabeth, Rajesh, Eric, and John. Yep, everybody's here. Okay, so welcome. We're going to get started on the ALI session here, but uh, just a little note. Somebody left their, their notebook here. I don't know if someone in the room is here. That, it's a lot of notes in here. A lot of notes. So I'll, I'll keep this and I'll announce it at the next one too, and we'll see if somebody left it. Hopefully they'll come back. Obviously, they're not interested in ALI, I guess, right now. <laughs> All right, so we're going to get into acute limb ischemia, obviously something that's very important to all of us that uh, practice uh, uh, peripheral arterial disease interventions. We have a really great panel today of uh, surgeons and, and uh, IC, et cetera. Uh, why don't we start with a talk first, and then we'll kind of get into some panel discussions and so forth. I want to introduce uh, Liz Genovese. She's uh, Head of the vascular surgery section at MUSC and, and comes with a lot of years of experience. And she's going to talk about endovascular versus surgical management of ALI. Okay. Well, thanks for coming back after lunch. So we're going to talk a little bit about endo versus open for ALI. Here are my disclosures. So acute limb ischemia affects about 1.5 patients out of every 10,000 persons in the U.S. and is highly morbid. It has about a 15 to 30 percent amputation rate and also a pretty high associated mortality, just secondary to some of the other comorbidities that come along with having acute limb ischemia. When I think about acute limb ischemia, I try to group it into four kind of categories. One's going to be your embolic. That's going to be kind of your well-organized thrombus. You're going to have bypass thrombosis and a variety of different types of bypasses. But when your bypass occludes, that's going to give you acute limb ischemia. And then you have your more in sight to disease. So your thrombosed stents or your thrombosed native disease. And then there's this other miscellaneous bucket. So that's going to be acute limb secondary to a dissection, a thrombosed aneurysm. Some iatrogenic injuries, trauma injuries, and then very rarely secondary to vasospasm. When you're thinking about treating this, there's a, there's a lot of different treatment methods. So you have an open approach, an endovascular approach, and then somewhere in between this hybrid approach. And I should put in my disclosures, I am a vascular surgeon, so this is actually one of my favorite operations. There's nothing any more satisfying than pulling a bunch of clout out of an artery and getting pulsatile bleeding. Um, it's actually what made me go into vascular surgery. It was my very first surgery I ever saw. This is my second favorite operation, a bypass. Um, but I'll tell you, there's nothing more miserable than doing a distal bypass at 2 o'clock in the morning for a cold leg. So we try to avoid these. And the other thing is, is that these are not permanent forever solutions. They come with their own problems, right? You can have vessel injury from Fogarty's. You can have significant blood loss. You can have wound difficulties. And bypasses do not stay open forever and often need reinterventions and have anywhere, depending on your indication, 50 to 80 percent primary patency just at one year. Traditionally, when we talk about open versus endo, we have a lot of historic data that compared open uh, revascularization to catheter-directed lysis. And these are some of the landmark trials that we, we led, leaned on in the 90s. When you looked at a meta-analysis that compared these um, randomized control trials or when you combine them with other retrospective studies, you can see that there is no difference in 30-day outcomes with regards to limb salvage. There was also no difference statistically between uh, mortality at 30 days, although it tended to favor a more minimally invasive procedure. One-year amputation rate was similar between the two groups. Um, what you did start to notice a difference that was pretty consistent in all the studies is higher rates of bleeding complications with catheter-directed thrombolysis and higher rates, obviously, of distal embolization. There have been a lot of studies that have looked at using ultrasound to accelerate the thrombolytic um, distribution of the, of the drug locally with catheter-directed thrombolysis. And what all the studies have uniformly shown is, is that it helps decrease thrombolysis time, but really doesn't affect any other outcomes other than that. 
The rates of some of the outcomes that make us a little bit hesitant to sometimes use catheter-directed lysis are um, bleeding, embolization, and stroke. And they're all on a fairly low rate, but significant bleedings requiring operations, significant blood transfusions, ranges anywhere from 5 to 13% in these studies. And some of these older studies had therapeutic heparin during catheter-directed lysis, which may have elevated that as well. Um, embolization ranges anywhere from 2 to 9, 10%. And then hemorrhagic stroke, although rare, is a pretty devastating complication at about 1 to 2 percent. We know that there's certain contraindications for CDT. Um, some are hard, some are more relative, but also you got to remember that you know you, you only have a certain window. If a patient has a pretty severe motor or neuro deficit, you're going to not be able to give them time to lice. There have been some studies that look at a combination of a hybrid, so an embolectomy, and then if there's not a good uh, outcome, then moving on to an endovascular treatment. And what this study demonstrated that was that over 50% of patients actually, when you once you did the embolectomy, you had to do something more. You had to treat their underlying stenosis, you had to stent an artery, or maybe you had to get some more residual thrombus. You weren't able to fully get out with the Fogarty, or maybe treat something more distally that embolized. Overall, this study showed that there was a significant um, benefit with regards to patency and limb salvage between the two groups, with the hybrid being a little bit more advantageous. But of course, there's a, there's a pretty significant selection bias, right? Patients who required this were a little bit of a different patient population. So I think single session endovascular treatments have really changed the game as to whether we do open versus endo. And I, I don't want to step on anyone else's presentations, but I'm going to touch on two of our common workhorses with regards to endo. So the first is going to be your pharmacomechanical uh, thrombectomy. This is going to uh, create a vortex and essentially solubilize and uh, remove a lot of fresh thrombus. You know, the, the things that you got to be careful with this, though, is, is that this if you have more subacute thrombus that can't be solubilized, it can actually embolize, and there's also a risk of acute kidney injury secondary to the hemolysis. The Pearl Registry is a registry of about 300 patients with acute limb ischemia treated with angiojet. And what they did was they looked at a propensity score of those who had angiojet treatment alone versus angiojet plus catheter-directed thrombolysis. What we can see is pretty high success rate, right? 83% of patients were able to be fully treated endovascularly, and about 50% required subsequent catheter-directed thrombolysis. The complications you see there on the right are what we typically associate with um, angiojet so pancreatitis, bleeding, and then uh, acute kidney injury. When they did this subgroup analysis, what they found is that patients without infrapopliteal involvement and without and who did not need catheter-directed thrombolysis did better. And I think that what that indicates is, is that this, the catheter-directed thrombolysis was probably being used to address underlying lesions that weren't fully cleared or distal embolization. There's been a lot of um, mechanical thrombectomy aspiration catheters. They've been out for quite a bit of time. If you, if you look, there's over 20 that are currently available in the U.S. and indicated for acute limb ischemia. What really kind of changed the game, at least for me as a vascular surgeon, to really almost uh, replace the Fogarty in some circumstances is going to be the engine that Penumbra came out. It allows for a more continuous uh, aspiration as opposed to the, you, you release a lot of your suction when you're doing it with a handheld syringe. Just going to touch on one recent study of the Indian trial, which is the um, prospective uh, trial of looking at acute limb ischemia and using penumbra catheters. What you can see is the distribution of the vessels included anywhere from the aorta all the way to below the knee and below the ankle, but a lot of the wheelhouse being in the, the SFA, the pop, and below the knee. And you can see there's a variety of different catheters that were used for this patient population, and a fair amount of them requiring the separator, which is an atraumatic separator to help kind of break up and pull in some of that thrombus when it corkscrews into the catheter itself. A pretty great uh, success rate, almost 90% from this catheter alone, and 95% success once you use your adjunctive techniques. So what do I use for acute limb ischemia? Well, it, it actually depends. We have a very heterogeneous patient population with a lot of different etiologies and lots of tools in our tool bag. So things that I think about when I'm going into a case is what's the etiology? Is it a chronic clot? Is it an acute clot? What's the extent of the thrombus? Is there underlying disease in the vessels? So we're going to have to treat something that we're not going to necessarily be able to clear in one session. Is there thrombosis in the outflow vessels, right? That's when catheter-directed lysis really does help us. Are there any prohibitive operative factors? And what's the baseline renal function?
So when we talk about this, here's kind of how I, I group everything. So open thrombectomy, I think, still does play a role. For me, it's well-organized thrombus in normal underlying vessels. If someone throws a cardiac embolus to the common femoral, that's an easy hour, hour and a half operation. But it does require groin incisions and general anesthesia. The other benefit of an open embolectomy is if someone has aortoiliac occlusive disease or a uh, common femoral and you're going to end up doing an end arterectomy at the same time. I don't love it when there's distal disease because then you end up converting that to that hybrid procedure. Surgical bypasses are pretty much reserved for patients who have continued to fail their endo management, and you know that the only way you're going to be able to reperfuse them is through a bypass. But again, very long procedure, a lot of general anesthesia, and you have to have outflow. If you don't have a patent outflow vessel, your bypass is not going to stay open. I think catheter-directed thrombolysis really does still play a role. Um, for me, it's when there's extensive thrombus and there's no evidence of outflow and you really need to open up that outflow. You just have to acknowledge the bleeding risks and the embolization risks that are still present, even though it's rare. Pharmacomechanical uh, thrombectomy, I find this to be really useful in a lot of fresh, high-volume thrombus. You can do this with minimal blood loss, um, but you can't. it can be inadequate, particularly if there's some underlying subacute, and you can sometimes actually embolize that if, if you're not kind of aware of that. You do have that risk of CKD and uh, augmenting that with your acute kidney injury, and you can't use it in a vessel that's less than three millimeters or if there's already a dissection because that vortex will, will uh, worsen that dissection. Percutaneous aspiration thrown back to me really is the wheelhouse for me. So I use this on acute, um, acute and subacute because you, of the different techniques that you can use with that. Um, and you can also treat underlying vessel disease in injunction to that. And I really don't have any ma major contraindications. So there's, there's, there's a lot of things out there. Um, and hopefully that's a nice introduction and we'll get into it some more with the rest of the panel. Thank you.